This video contains elements that are not suitable for children under the age of 14. Viewer discretion is advised. Three down, one more to go, then we're finally out of the nitrogen era. I can't wait to get to the burning era just to wash the taste from my mouth. For a celebratory year, 2011 was rather underwhelming. As mentioned previously, Series 15 was terrible, and David Diesel's just came off as overhyped in retrospect. At first it was well received with the rhyming and alliteration cut down, making Diesel 10 a real menace once again after a pretty underwhelming portrayal in Calling All Engines, but now, most of the fandom despises it, with some people like myself ranking it as even worse than Missy Island Rescue. And as for the final book in the Railway series, Thomas and His Friends, it was pretty much recycled material. Thomas and the Swan was simply a retelling of an annual story from 1992, with an introduction featuring Pip and Emma becoming the new express engines to London that kind of went nowhere. We didn't get to see much of how Gordon reacted to this change, but that could have been an interesting book in and of itself. Gordon did get a story to himself, however, with Gordon's fire service, probably the best of the book, and even mentioning the Peel Goddard branch line for the first, and sadly only, time. It may have been a rewrite to one of the stories in the Thomas Noisy book, but I could be wrong. Buffer bashing, however, was simply the worst story, probably the entire railway series, being the middle engine of Audrey's writing with no resolution. Centenary was just a rewrite of Golden Jubilee, and probably even more underwhelming. So all in all, Thomas and his friends did not live up to its high fever, ending the railway series on a very weak note. Now with Christopher in his early 80s and the fact that he has no plans to continue, we may never get the stories he wanted to tell but couldn't. Alas, poor Barry, we could have known him, Christopher. But was it all bad news for 2011? Not really. Greg Tiernan informed the Soder Island forums about some changes ahead, such as Sharon Miller stepping down from head writer and later being superseded by Andrew Brenner, who was then working on the CGI incarnation of Fireman Sam, beginning with Series 17 to air in 2013, which we'll cover next time. This promised a return to the quality storytelling and abandoning the Free Strikes formula altogether from Series 9 to 15. Brenner would also be joined by producer Ian McHugh, who had arrived during the production of Day of the Diesels, as well as Series 15 and 16 and he would keep that mantle all the way up to Series 24, being a creative executive producer for Series 21 and 22. In February 2012, shortly before Series 16 had begun airing, Apex partners with Zell Hit Entertainment to Mattel, and the rest is pretty much history. So, how does Series 16 stack up? Is it as awful as the free series prior, or was it a sign of better things to come? Well, there were signs of better things to come, but they were very few and far in between, one of them being that the rhyming element was removed altogether, but the constant alliteration and free strikes formula still plagued the writing. That, and winter holiday, at least if you were from America. Not only that, after annoying the piss out of fans during series 14 and 15, the Loggy Locos and Misty Island were only prominently featured in just two episodes, while appearing in a brief scene in Welcome Stafford. Starting with Series 17, the Loggy Locos and Misty Island were pretty much sent to the scrap heap, with Ferdinand briefly appearing in Signals Crossed if you look closely enough, and with Misty Island being made fun of in the way she does it. Sitting in your shed? No. Working at the waste dump? Taking monkeys to the animal park? Ooh, I know. Going to Misty Island? No. Not gonna comment. Yeah, we get that Misty Island was a terrible invention, but it had been four years by the time it aired in 2016. How many viewers from the actual target audience would have gotten the joke? Still, all we can say to the Logging Loco's disappearance is... Good riddance. You're no fun. Oh shut up, Mr. Vats Right. Who does he think he is? Groot? Anyway, for all the badness that Series 16 endured, much like the free series prior, it did have some good episodes, one of them being Express Coming Through where, for once, it felt like Thomas and Gordon were in character. They even did a callback to Thomas's train. Flashbang Wallop even featured a picture of a Garrett locomotive, which had been Greg Tiernan's desire to include at some point. Although one of them did eventually appear in full CGI in the form of Nia's friend Kwaku from Big World Big Adventures, Welcome Stafford wasn't too bad either, with the battery-powered electric engine having a wonderful voice provided by Keith Wickham, and with some dialogue that felt a bit more natural and, at times, funny. I feel like Stafford could have done more with the right idea for the character they've given him, but the most noteworthy episode of this series was Percy and the Calliope, 
in which the Free Strikes formula was implemented alongside the moral about not giving up, showing that it could work if handled properly. And of course, the ending. <laughs> but then, with a cough and a splutter, it began to play. Percy beamed from buffer to buffer. I don't think I could really explain how happy I was when I first heard it. It really did feel like better things to come. At certain points. We did see the return of the Scarlowy Five, but because Duncan's real-life relative Douglas, not Donald's brother, Hamlet, thank you, <coughs> Douglas was undergoing an overhaul at the time, Duncan was dropped from Series 16 in Blue Mountain Mystery, eventually returning in Series 18, and rather oddly proportioned. To properly render the engines, the team at Nitrogen Studios went to the Teleclin Railway for reference, which also finally fixed the issue with Peter Sam's funnels in Series 4. The episode in which they return in, Don't Bother Victor, was nothing short of underwhelming. It was basically the same plot as Sir Handel in Charge, which in turn was the same plot as the Green Controller. And I'll come back to the Christmas Tree Express soon enough. Blue Mountain Mystery for me is the true return to the Scarlet Engines, as well as the introduction of Luke. He didn't appear in Series 16, nor did Owen and Merrick, so I won't discuss them here. I'll do so for Luke next time, but Owen and Merrick, eh, don't care for either of them since they barely did much anyway. The same goes for Winston the inspection trolley. While he did have a few things to do in Series 17, half the time, I almost forget that he exists. Chronologically, Series 16 comes after Blue Mountain Mystery, yet it aired before, with only Winston appearing in Happy Birthday Sir, but that hardly made much of a difference since none of the other newbies appeared as well. Production had started in April 2010, with Andrew Viner's website confirming that Thomas and the Rubbish Train had been commissioned around that time. It was the last series in which Sam Barlow was the story executive, and he even admitted in an interview with Soder Island Forms that the formula they went for with Series 13-16 to was not a good one in hindsight. Well, duh. Rebecca Evans served as script editor for this series only, but only for the second half. 19 episodes aired in February and March, with the Christmas Tree Express being held back for Christmas 2012, and all I have to say is... What was the point? Series 14 and 15 had their Christmas themed episodes to air alongside the rest when they premiered, and heck, Series 16 had Salty Surprise and Emily's Winter Party Special to air alongside the non-Christmas, uh, sorry, non-Winter Holiday episodes. So there was absolutely no excuse to hold the Christmas Tree Express back, especially of how awful it is. In fact, that episode is the coalition of everything wrong with the Nitrogen Era jammed into 9 minutes. Hey, can I point out that this season is the last- Shut it, Matt! You can talk about Emily later! Now scram! As I was saying, everything that was wrong with the Nitrogen Era was jammed into 9 minutes. The Free Strikes formula, absolutely annoying alliteration, Thomas being crane shunted where he doesn't belong, Toby being hopelessly out of character, the mere presence of the logging locos in Misty Island, the use of Winter Holiday for America, the lack of logic and continuity with Toby being afraid of going to Misty Island despite having been there in the past, and Ben Small's vocal performance, and Ben Small's vocal perf- Wait, what? He said Ben Small's vocal performances. You know, the guy who voiced Thomas? He also voiced a few others too, such as Toby, Rodeus, Flynn, and a couple of other characters. Come to think of it, he did voice Stanley and Charlie for the US dub as well, but not for the UK dub? Huh, that's kind of strange. He did sound a bit stilted in seasons 13 to 16, but I think he improved drastically in seasons 17 through 18, King of the Railway, Tale of the Brave, but yeah, Bloomer mystery is hit or miss, I think. Like I said previously, I'll admit, some of his voices are pretty good, particularly his Renee's voice, but even in season 17 and 18, his Thomas voice still sucks. I'm sure Ben is a nice guy, but when it comes to voicing the number one, there are other people who have done a much better job voicing him. No, I do not count John Bellows as he only voiced Thomas in bits of the Tatmar work print, not the final product. That's enough, you guys! Can I please get back to finishing what I was about to say? I've already endured Matt interrupting me many times in previous episodes, and I don't want you guys doing the same thing. Ah, uh, fine. I only came here because Mike, Matt, and Rachel are here. Sorry, dude. Then, why are you okay with me interrupting in Seasons 9 and 10? Uh, okay, you got me there, sis. We'll chat about this as a group discussion another time. <laughs>
Okay, chat with you later, mate. So, as I was saying, the Christmas Tree Express was shit, but that wasn't what I consider the worst episode of a Nitrogen Era. Oh no, that dishonor goes to Sodor Surprise Day, an episode so horrendous that it should never have existed to begin with. I've always despised it even in my late teens, and that comes down to what happens at Brendam Docks. Thomas startles Cranky, causing him to drop a crate of fireworks in which they go rogue all over the place, and they could have potentially hurt someone or worse, killed them, not to mention property damage. Damage. If you thought Wonky Whistle's moment with Thomas running off and nearly endangering the workman while fixing his whistle was awful, then this is that moment times infinity. Thomas should have been punished for causing all of this chaos, but instead, he sets everything right with no punishment. <sighs> you know, when I was a kid, Thomas was my favorite character, but seeing his fall from grace culling with Soda Surprise Day really hurt me inside, and it still does to this day. Thomas was meant to be a role model that kids could look up to, even back in his early days when he was a cheeky station pilot. But then he became an idiot during the hit model era, then the nitrogen era came on, turned him into dark era Patrick Star on rails. Just seeing Thomas fall like that just... 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 <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I just don't know what else to say. Other than Series 16 sucks like the free series prior. Let's just finish this damn episode already. I did not enjoy revisiting the Nitrogen Era in the slightest. Series 14 was the least bad season of a lot, but only by default. And while I do have Series 14 ranked as the worst of the entire show, it, along with 15 and 16, could be placed in any order because all three of them are the bottom of the barrel for Thomas and friends. Sure, there are gems here and there, and I'll get to that in a bit, but are they worth the fiery flames and Sodor surprise days? No, absolutely not. I'd recommend skipping this era altogether. You're not missing a whole lot, believe me. If I never have to sift through almost 12 hours worth of garbage like that ever again, I can die happy. So what do I think are the least awful episodes of the Nitrogen Era? Let's find out. Number 10, Victor Says Yes. Number 9, Welcome Stafford. Number 8, Flashbang Wallop. Number 7, Steamy Sodor. Number 6, Snow Tracks. Number 5, Being Percy. Number 4, Express Coming Through. Number 3, A Blooming Mess. Number 2, Percy and the Calliope. And number 1, Tickled Pink. But as for the worst the worst, well I could have made this a top 20, maybe top 25, but these 10 episodes are so bad that they deserve to be a list on their own. Number 10, Thomas and the Runaway Kite. Number 9, up, up, and away. Number eight, Buzzy Bees. Number seven, Henry's Magic Box. Number six, Thomas and the Snowman Party. Number five, Ho Ho Snowman. Number four, James the Rescue. Number three, The Christmas Tree Express. Number two, it's a two-way tie between Fiery Flynn and Race the Rescue. And number one, you know what. Ugh, thank God this is over. Now I can finally relieve myself from all this madness. <sighs> Uh, Zach? Where are you going? Yes. Boy, the nitrogen era really did a number on you, didn't it? Well, I think I'll end this episode off for him. But before I do, allow me to say a few things. Walt Disney once said, You're dead if you aim only for kids. Adults are only kids growing up anyway. I believe that's not only a very poignant quote, but an accurate metaphor for when it comes to the nitrogen era of Thomas and Friends. Both the Railway Series and the good seasons of Thomas the Tank Engine became successful because they not only thought about entertaining children, they thought about the adults too. You've got to remember that you're not merely writing for children. You're writing for the mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, grandfathers, grandmothers who've got to read the stories aloud. Not just once, but over and over and over again. The morals and the, the morals that the, the, the things that the morals of these stories were never jammed down the kid's throat. They weren't blatant. They weren't um, in capital letters. They were gently massaged into the framework of the show. Parent and child can read a railway series book or watch an episode of the classic series of Thomas and they both can enjoy it. That's not the case with the Nitrogen era of Thomas and Friends, which is only appealing to little kids to the point where only little kids can seem to enjoy it. 
But a parent is supposed to spend time with their children and nurture them. So, when parents are being forced to suffer through stuff like Wonky Whistle or Sora Surprise Day or any other episode from that era, they feel less encouraged to do their jobs. I speak not only for myself, but for the rest of us, that seeing how awful these episodes were made us more appreciative of what was to come. A writer who cared about what young children were watching and episodes that a general audience could enjoy. Not only was this man involved with the Thomas series since its glory days, but he's someone who knew and cared about what the series stood for. And who is that man, you ask? Well, that's going to have to wait until next time. So, do you want me to close off this episode for you, Zach? Okay, uh, he's Zach, you're watching Sodorama, and he'll see you next time. In every life you live, there will always be challenges. So shine your light ahead to face the man.